Hey folks, Mark Yerkes here, coming to you from the port of Katakoi, where I'm about to take a ferry ride across the Bosporus to the historic district of Istanbul, where we will take a look at three monuments related to the Byzantine Empire's turbulent years of transition from being predominantly pagan in religion to predominantly Christian. So stick around. Istanbul is an expansive city that surrounds the important Bosporus waterway by which ships pass between the Black Sea and the Aegean and Mediterranean seas. As in ancient times, the Bosporus is the dividing line between two continents, Asia and Europe. And that makes it an incredibly important location culturally, commercially, and strategically. The majority of the population is Muslim, and there is no sparsity of mosque. Yet, the city has a long history of cultural and religious change. For millennia, the people of Asia Minor followed after their own brand of Eastern paganism. After Alexander's conquest of the region, there was a noticeable shift to Greek paganism and cultural assimilation. Then the Roman Empire rose to power, and the form of idolatry became Roman in nature, with many of the same Greek gods being worshipped by different names. Paganism did not begin to fade until Emperor Constantine embraced Christianity in the first half of the 4th century, but it was not a swift transition nor a particularly peaceful one. The historic district, where the ancient Roman city of Byzantium was established, and which Constantine renamed as Constantinople when he made it his capital, is located on the Fati Peninsula because it was more easily defensible once its walls were fully constructed and the inlet known as the Golden Horn could be blocked from enemy ships entering. But there are no longer chains blocking the entrance. Ferries ply the waterway daily bringing domestic and foreign tourists from across the city Many come to see the Topkapi Palace with all its treasures, or the magnificent Blue Mosque. Yet there are other sights to be seen and appreciated, perhaps not as beautiful or glorious, but no less significant in historical context. From the moment one arrives in the historic district, it becomes apparent that you have entered an area akin to a theme park. Vendors ply their trade in snack foods, Purchasing an ice cream cone becomes an entertainment from a Turkish version of a clown. Public trolleys follow a route to the most popular attractions. But most visitors seem to arrive on tour buses. You see dozens of groups faithfully following their tour guides. They are often the ones holding a flag aloft in case their group members get lost. Tickets, including multiple museum passes, are sold near the entrances of the main sites to those who choose to go it alone. But if you really want someone to show you around, there will be plenty of opportunities. You will be approached by numerous touts initiating conversations and trying to be your friend. They will offer their services as a guide, perhaps even for free, until the tour is over. Or they will invite you to their shop for tea then pressure you into buying something. The Turkish people can be very open and friendly, but you must remember that you are in the tourist district, and that makes you a target. Be careful. Inquire at the ticket booths regarding official tour guides. Our first stop will be at the ancient Roman Forum. There is very little remaining to indicate the shape of the Forum, but one monument remains at its center, the Column of Constantine, which he erected to commemorate the founding of his new Rome, Constantinople. Right now I'm having to stand a long ways away from the column because it's hard to appreciate the actual size. It's 57 meters tall. 
and that's not including the pedestal at the top where the statue was placed. Now, this is not originally called the Column of Constantine, nor is this the original location. This column was actually built in the Temple of Apollo in Rome. But when Constantine moved the center of his government to Constantinople, he brought the column with him. Not only did he bring the column, he also brought Apollo. But to show his sincerity of his faith, he removed the face of Apollo and replaced it with his own. Makes you wonder about his ego. People tend to give Constantine the credit for making Christianity the religion of his empire, but this is incorrect. His Edict of Milan merely ended persecution and made it legal to be a Christian and coexist with paganism. It wasn't until 67 years later, under Emperor Theodosius I, that Christianity became the official religion of the empire and paganism was rejected. During this transition, Christianity became more and more popular. Even Constantine, whose ascension to the throne was largely due to the support of Christian legions, seems to have evolved in his appreciation of the faith as a source of maintaining stability in the empire. So for him, toleration of Christianity was mostly a political expediency. I'm standing here at the base of the column. And though we might have some doubts about the sincerity of the conversion of Constantine from paganism to Christianity, his mother seems to have been a true believer. In fact, she went on a quest to the land of Israel to discover the actual locations of the crucifixion, of the burial, and the Last Supper, and some other locations. And in the process, she came back with a lot of ancient relics. In fact, there were so many relics that Helen found, Helena found, that three of them are purportedly buried in the base of the column behind me. Uh, supposedly, there is an axe that was used by Noah to build the ark, a portion of the true cross, and some leftovers from the feeding of the 5,000 with loaves and fishes. Don't tell anybody, but I think she was taken advantage of. In Constantine's time, the column was a site for pagan worship and sacrifices. This was a great distress to the Christian bishops who eventually influenced Theodosius to outlaw paganism in the year 380. Yet Theodosius was not immune to the temptations of secular power. He too wanted to be remembered and honored so he established another forum, and had a column with a statue of himself as its centerpiece. That column has been lost to time, but another monument erected by Theodosius does still exist. This might just look like another busy square in Istanbul, but this is a very important location. This is where politics and entertainment mix together. This is the Hippodrome. Facing one of Africa's most dangerous animals, spy Hippo must hold his ground. As the hippos dive, so must spy Hippo. I said Hippodrome, not Hippodrone. Hey, I do apologize. Apart from the city walls, the Hippodrome was the largest structure in Constantinople. Constantine saw the value in renovating and using it to appease the crowd with lavish entertainments. The seating capacity was an estimated 60,000 people. Little of it remains, just some of the rounded southern Svendone and the central Spina. This central island around which the chariots raced contained a hodgepodge of monuments to demonstrate the power of the emperor and the empire. Some were to commemorate victories, but others were related to paganism, such as the now missing statue of Hercules, the twin gods Castor and Pollux, and the statues and altars to Zeus and Artemis. Still existing is part of the Serpent Column, an ancient Greek sacrificial tripod brought here by Constantine and the Egyptian obelisk erected by Theodosius.
This was actually built in 1450 BC by Pharaoh Tutmosis in Egypt. It was then brought to Rome and from Rome to Constantinople as the centerpiece of the Hippodrome. One has to wonder how the Eastern Orthodox Church would eventually canonize Constantine and how two emperors, both of whom claimed to be Christians, could not only tolerate but in some ways support paganism. The answer, of course, is related to politics and certain decisions that were viewed well by the Church. But in attempting to do good, these rulers may have been blind to the potential harm they were causing, and the harm that had already been ingrained before they rose to power. Games. It's cleverer than I thought. Clever. Fear and wonder, powerful combination. Oh, Mr. Mob, you'll conjure magic for them and they'll be distracted. You take away their freedom and still their war. You'll bring them death. And they will love him for it. Indeed, the brutal mob mentality already existed within the populace of the Roman Empire. The bloodlust was reinforced throughout the centuries by gladiator games and horrific public executions. Transferring the government to Constantinople did not change the past. Persecution of Christians for their faith may have ended, but gladiatorial combat was not forbidden by imperial decree until the year 399. Kill him. Well, what's the matter now? Kill him! Kill him, you imbecile! Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! Even afterward, the mob needed a substitute, and they found it in the Hippodrome. Public executions of criminals, as well as humiliating punishments of political and religious rivals, continued there for many centuries. But the races were the main source of appeasing the crowd, not only because they could result in bloody crashes, but because gambling on the races was addictive, holding forth the potential of bringing a fortune to the lucky few. columns were in the central spine of the race course. So where I'm walking right now was actually the track where the chariots raced. Certainly a lot of blood was spilt on this dirt. But nothing can compare to one day in the year 532 AD when in this spot in the Hippodrome some 30,000 people were slaughtered. There were four chariot factions based upon colors. Red, blue, green, and white. Each had their own following, who, like modern football fans, could take the games far too seriously. Into the 5th and 6th centuries, two teams became dominant, the Blues and the Greens. Huge fights would frequently break out between them, and sometimes people would die. Emperor Justinian wanted to put an end to the hooliganism. Up until that point, the fighters would be jailed for a while and then released. But after one particularly brutal melee resulting in death, Justinian refused to pardon two of the perpetrators. This so enraged the fans of the Blues and Greens that they actually joined together in protest. When the emperor entered his royal box at the next races, they began screaming, Nika! Nika! which means victory or conquer the very words they would scream at the racers. The days of destruction that followed became known as the Nika Riots. Much of the city was burned down, including the Hagia Sophia and Hagia Irene churches. The mob chose someone else to be emperor, and Justinian was prepared to flee in fear for his life. But his wife Theodora refused to leave. She had been an actress and prostitute when she met Justinian and knew that fleeing would end all that she had gained. 
she is quoted as telling her husband, If you wish to save yourself, my lord, there is no difficulty. We are rich, over there is the sea, and yonder are the ships. Yet reflect for a moment whether once you have escaped to a place of security, you would gladly exchange such safety for death. Royal purple is the noblest shroud. Justinian, then, was emboldened to stay, and he ordered two stalwart generals named Belisarius and Mundus to take their troops to the Hippodrome, which was the main gathering place of the rioters. They entered and put about 30,000 people to the sword. Thus ended the Nika riots. Was Justinian a tyrant? Not really, but certainly a weak, worldly human being with many moral flaws. Yet both he and his wife have been canonized as saints for quashing the riot and for rebuilding the churches that were destroyed, and other good works. But at what cost, and by whose standard? Hey folks, just a quick break to say thank you for tuning in. If you're enjoying what you're seeing, please give us a thumbs up and send the link to the video to a friend who might enjoy it. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe, click the notification bell, send us your comments, it would be much appreciated. And now, back to the video. Our final monument is by far the smallest, occupying an enclosed area of excavation across the street from Sultanahmet Square and beside the tracks of the tramway. It is easily overlooked by tourists who have no idea what it is or its significance. Yet, it is probably the most important monument in the city, just as its equivalent had been for Rome. All distances in the old Roman Empire were marked from a million stone in Rome. The mile markers along Roman roads measured the distance to this stone, in the same way, a new million stone was erected during the Byzantine Empire to measure the distance to mile zero in Constantinople, the center of the world. Either by chance or intentionally, the importance of the Miliarium Aureum is still recognized in Istanbul. Every tourist site is posted with a replica bearing information about the site or object it identifies. The Roman roads were essential in the first century for the spread of the gospel by Paul and the other apostles. The timing on God's part, as always, was perfect. Every city in the empire was just two feet away. But the roads were just as important in the Byzantine era for spreading the now legalized Christian religion, for better or worse, to the rest of the world. Unfortunately for many, Relief from overt persecution and an increase in prosperity brought about the kind of divided loyalty that Jesus spoke against. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 People began converting to Christianity for the wrong reasons because it became politically and financially beneficial to do so. Satan had tried to destroy Christianity through persecution, but that only helped the church expand and grow stronger. Now he had begun a new tactic, normalizing Christianity, institutionalizing it, and corrupting it from within. Thank you for joining me on this visit to Istanbul's past. More videos are forthcoming from Turkey by God's grace. So be sure to tune in again and join us for even more obscure Christian history.